Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, depending where you are in the world, because you are connected today from many countries. I'm Julien Marcel. I'm the chief executive officer of the box office company. And I'm very happy uh, to host with our box office pro team this uh, first ICTA technology reboot camp. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Frank. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Before uh, starting this, uh, this seminar, I would like to, uh, to take a moment to uh, recognize our sponsor for this, uh, for this session today. Uh, Dolby is once again sponsoring this uh, Box Office Pro live session. Thanks a lot to the, the team at uh, Dolby. I think on top of this uh, image of Dolby, you can download this page that will give you access to specific links to the Dolby shutdown uh, documents with very uh, important and uh, useful uh, link there. And uh, here with us uh, today to, uh, to uh, represent uh, Dolby, let me uh, bring on stage uh, Beth, um, Beth Fig, the senior uh, sales manager in North America for Dolby. Uh, let's see if it works and if we manage to get uh, Dolby uh, on screen. Good Beth? morning, Julian. Or good, good morning, afternoon, Julian. Or good afternoon. Or good afternoon. Or good afternoon. Or good afternoon. Or I appreciate being here. here depending on where the reason you are. are. So I appreciate being here. As Hello, again. everyone. My name is Beth Figge, and I'm senior sales manager at Dolby Laboratories. We at Dolby look for ways to help our industry partners to maintain equipment during the shutdown. We have a document available online to assist you. A link will be provided at the end of this message or simply contact us at cinemasupport at dolby.com. We don't want to dive too deeply into the details of the document as Frank Tease will be covering this more in depth during this discussion. One of the areas of concern that we've identified is that cinemas will need to test encrypted playback to ensure that their servers are working correctly before reopening. This may be difficult as keys for previously played content have expired and new content keys are generally not available until the cinema is close to reopening. It is important to test servers prior to reopening to determine if there are any hardware issues or if replacements are needed. The ability to initiate a repair or exchange hardware a week or more before opening the cinema allows time to remedy equipment problems. To assist you, we've created the Dolby Encrypted Content Tester. This is an encrypted trailer that is available on our customer portal. We have generated keys for over 115,000 Dolby Media Blocks and hosted the playback keys online, allowing users to test whenever they want. The content is 2D and we've compressed the image to keep the delivery file size low. For audio, this content has Dolby Atmos and Dolby Surround 7.1 audio tracks and can be played with, a with any cinema processor. Dolby is committed to the cinema industry and our partners, and we hope that together we will be providing amazing experiences to the movie-going public in the very near future. We appreciate you and all of your efforts, and we are pleased to support the ICTA and Box Office Pro. I hope to see you all in person soon. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Beth. As promised, here is the slide. Let me now introduce uh, Rebecca to uh, host uh, this uh, session and welcome our guest. Thanks again, and thanks, uh, thank you, the ICTA, for letting us uh, do the, this very important seminar with you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca Polly. I'm the deputy editor at Box Office Pro, and I want to thank you all uh, for tuning into the first session of the ICTA Cinema Technology Reboot Camp webinar series. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank the ICTA, who uh, we at the Box Office Company are thrilled to partner with to present this panel. I'm getting all the important technical elements of your movie theaters back up and running. Uh, a few logistical items before we start. Obviously, um, everyone's using the chat function, which is great. Um, just as just a reminder, everybody keep it nice, keep it polite. Uh, I, I don't expect that anyone is coming into this session ready to throw down, but just in case, keep it friendly. Uh, and as Julian mentioned, we have the question tab. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end of this session. So if you do have questions, please pop them in there. Uh, and even if you don't have questions, I'd, I'd recommend you go in there and upvote anything that you want to know the answer to, uh, get it bump up the queue. Um, 
And finally, uh, if you're having any any technical issues, audio, video, anything like that, uh, I'll quote the sitcom, the IT crowd, uh, just try and turn it off and on again, uh, aka refresh your page. That usually works. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Frank of Moving Image Technologies and, of course, uh, the ICTA to moderate this panel. Frank, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Um, my name is Frank Tees, as, as was said. Um, my name, or I'm uh, Vice President of the ICTA as well as Vice President of Technical Sales Support for Moving Image Technologies. So if we can get to the presentation, we'll, get, uh, we'll move forward with the uh, topics for today. So first off, a quick note on ICTA and what we are. The ICTA is a global network of professionals in the motion picture industry. Members of the ICTA are those professionals and companies that manufacture, service, create, sell, and use cinema equipment. Uh, and our members are on the cutting edge of new technologies and have been the driving force in a lot of the developments uh, in cinema. We promote, promote technological advancements and uh, educational seminars and programs, and we stand for excellence and professionalism in the industry. So uh, all of the members of the ICTA consider uh, all of our partners in cinema exhibition, content, service, manufacturing, innovation, and support, not only our friends, but part of our family. We are all here for you and each other during this intermission in our business and lives, and we eagerly hope to see you all as the curtain rises again in your theaters, at trade shows, and in person coming soon. So uh, about today's format, we'll be addressing uh, restoring your cinema to service, uh, things to look for and troubleshooting of simple items, and when to ask for help. We have a panel of experts that are going to be covering uh, uh, projectors, servers, uh, both SMS and TMS, audio systems, screen, and point of sale. Uh, please present your questions in the Q&A pane, and we'll address as many as possible during the live Q&A. And all of today's videos will be posted on our website and our Facebook page. Uh, you can uh, visit our page or like our uh, Facebook page, and we'll uh, continue with these seminars throughout the sum uh, summer. Before we start, uh, we'll be providing uh, general technical information in a summary format. Uh, we're not going to go too deep in anything, although it may seem like it. Uh, this is in order to point kind of everybody in the, in the right direction for those who may not have the technical knowledge. But, uh, you know, a disclaimer, uh, do not proceed beyond your technical abilities uh, or comfort level. Ask for help. Call your servicer, call your NOC, uh, or, uh, you know, your technical resources if needed. Uh, the information is not intended to supersede your company policies, your business practices, or any local law for access, but uh, to act as a guide should you need it. And we're doing the best we can to cover a broad range of topics. We're not going to be able to cover everything during uh, this webinar, uh, but uh, you know we will be able to answer questions. Uh, so feel free to uh, to uh, answer or send some questions our way via the Q and A pane. So next, we have uh, Projector Power Up with Dan Rupel. We'll be continuing with our, our videos on these topics. Give us a second here as we just queue up the video, uh, which will start shortly. Frank, do you want to like sing a song for us or anything? Sure, yeah. I, I can stand okay. up and dance as well. So. Uh, there we go. Hello, everyone. I'm here at the, Hello, the Technology Reboot Camp, and I'm here with uh, Dan Rupel, Director of Field Services for Tr Strong Technical Services. And he's going to be going over with us today, projector power-ups. Good to see you, Dan. Thanks, Frank. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to the folks at ICTA and the folks at... Uh, Box Office Pro for uh, for hosting this and uh, look forward to getting the uh, industry back on board and uh, theaters opening up real soon here. So, All right, so uh, what are some of the first things we can do uh, to uh, get these projectors powered up? All right, so we're gonna start with projector power-ups. Uh, 
Our first slide is booth environment and general practice. Before we actually start to power up the projection systems and get everything tested, there's a few things environmentally uh, that we should probably go through beforehand. Um, so prior to powering up your cinema equipment, ensure that the booth climate is set to operating temperature and all exhaust systems are operating. Um, ideally, we're going to go through at that point in time after, after everything's up to temperature and in inspect the large projector compartments. Um, check for water damage, check for animal intrusion, check for any chewed wiring, um, any debris that's been brought in from rodents or anything like that. We're going to want to get that stuff cleaned up. Um, obviously, based on comfort comfortability, uh, clean out what you can. Uh, if you're not comfortable, always feel free to reach out to your local cinema service provider uh, and they can come in and do that work for you. Um, on, outside of that, we're going to want to check air filter conditions, coolant levels, um, in the event that you have a xenon lamp set up, you're going to want to check and make sure that uh, the xenon lamp is properly installed and, and ready to go before you fire that up. So uh, in most of our general discussions with the manufacturers, it's been, you know, a general consensus of 48 hours prior to testing that everything should be powered on. Um, I think looking at this from the bigger perspective, we're probably looking at, you know, a week or maybe longer, uh, just from a standpoint, we want to make sure that you guys have every opportunity to get your equipment uh, up to speed. If you should run into any issues, having the ability to get parts, having the ability to get your cinema service provider uh, field technicians out to do service work for you, preventative maintenance, uh, and so on. Um, so a majority of this stuff can be gone through. Uh, at the booth level, but if you're uncomfortable with any aspect of this process, please consult your cinema service provider uh, or manufacturer to request uh, assistance. All right, great. Uh, can we go into the sp uh, projector specific uh, items? Absolutely. Uh, so we have projector specific items from Christie, Cineonic, NEC, and Sony. Um, as many of you know, the the Christie, NEC, and Cineonic Barco projectors are um, all DLP base equipment. So a lot of this stuff is going to be uh, redundant. So I'll try to get through as much of this stuff as I can as quickly as possible. Um, obviously, we want to follow all previous general practices and environmental steps. Um, from there, we're going to want to check and secure, make sure that all power cables have been secured. Um, all circuit breakers are turned on and working properly. Um, once you get to that point, you can power on the equipment. Uh, bring it out of standby if necessary, and once the equipment is all green, then you can start to move along with the, the testing. Uh, you're going to want to check alignment, calibrate colors and brightness uh, as needed and, and as time allows, and then ultimately move on to verifying encrypted content and functionality of all your automation. Uh, we have some links at the end of the presentation that are going to point you both to the individual manufacturer mandates, but also to uh, encrypted content and, and some content that's going to be a bit available to test uh, right up until it's available from the actual uh, exhibitors. So Chrissy did put in some specific stuff about laser projection models. Um, the, they are requesting a minimum of 24 hours of stable temperature and humidity prior to operation. Um, outside of that, the general consensus is, you know, powering the equipment up every seven days for a duration of about three hours. That's going to give you ample time to get the bat internal batteries charged up um, and basically just, you know, run through of operation. Uh, on the Christie CP2000ZX, M, Solaria 1, and Solaria 1 Plus, it's recommended that these units be powered on every three days if they have an IMB Series 2. So at this point in time, we'll move on to Cineonic Barco. Um, Cineonic Barco touched on the fact that this is a, you know, a prime opportunity to get as much preventative maintenance done as possible. Um, the theaters are empty, uh, so th there's no better time than now to, you know, perform maintenance A and B, to uh, get filters clean, get lens surfaces clean, clean port windows, uh, vacuum out the projector completely, um, and really go through a full calibration uh, of everything from top to bottom. Now, one of the things that you're going to want to make sure of um, throughout doing the sequential power-ups, the, the every seven days or every three days, 
Um, you know, make sure that your real-time clock, ICP clocks, make sure that the NTP time server, that those are syncing up properly. Uh, in some cases, if, if the time drift gets more than six minutes, you might be required to replace an ICP board. Um, so if you notice any errors like that, please reach out to your NOC service provider or the individual manufacturer. On the NEC side, um, again, a general follow-up for the, the practice or general practice items. Uh, they touch specifically on some of the items as far as the Gore board for the Series 1 and the Enigmas for the Series 2s. Uh, typically, those batteries last about six months. Um, hopefully, we're not going to get to that point. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're trending at just a few months right now, and, and we're hoping that this shouldn't become a, an issue moving forward. So, uh, same, similar process, powering up. Once you get to the status, make sure everything's green before moving forward. And then, you know, general checks of alignment, color calibration, uh, and verifying KDMs. Uh, on to Sony. Uh, as you all, most of you know, uh, Sony is a little bit different uh, in the way that they are built versus the DLP systems. Uh, most Sony equipment is going to have a UPS in place. Uh, Sony recommends to power up the UPS 48 hours prior to testing to ensure proper charging of the batteries. Uh, one of the primary focuses for auditoriums that have 3D is to check 3D convergent uh, as well as all the other alignment. So um, with the Sony units, um, they don't have typically a standalone server. So you're going to want to check hard drive status um, on all of the Sony equipment as well as the uh, chiller status on the 815. Um, some of the specific information for that is to inject distilled water and run for 15 minutes, check the flow rate, visually check the system to make sure that it's not dirty. And if it's dirty, you know, perform manual cleaning. Uh, if any of this happens and you're not comfortable with it, uh, as previously stated, please feel free to reach out to the Sony Network Operations Center or your local field service provider. That's great. Thank you very much, Dan. I think, uh, you know, with the links here, when we show them, uh, I think the big key takeaway here is that uh, please give yourself adequate time to go in, power, uh, clean things up, power things up, uh, get some good checks in there just in case uh, we have uh, a need for, or you have a need for uh, service uh, to call uh, your service provider or your NOC to, uh, for them to address it um, accordingly. So <clears throat> that's uh, Dan Ruppel with Strong Technical Services. Thank you very much. Thanks, Frank. Okay, next we'll be going into servers. There I am. So uh, we'll be going into both SMS and TMS. It's a little bit thick as far as the, the content, but there's a lot to cover. So uh, we'll be going into the, the video shortly. Hello everyone. In this section of the Technology Reboot Camp, we're joined with joined by Kobe Bone, who's CEO of Tri-State Digital Cinema Services, and he's going to go over server SMS and TMS rebooting uh, procedures. Kobe, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Uh, I mean, this is an exciting time and helping everybody out. We're all in the same boat together, so I'm uh, I'm excited. All right. So, what can we do with the servers? What do you got to look for when we reboot servers? Well, let's see here. Um, on this, when you are rebooting the servers and the TMS, you want to make sure that uh, everything's connecting. Um, and on my next slide here, we uh, kind of go through that. Uh, you definitely want to make sure that everything else is powered on the projector, uh, network devices, POS systems. You got to make sure all that stuff's done. Um, it's a good idea to have the TMS on at the same time. So it can start uh, syncing with the POS system and possibly start adjusting the the times for the movies that you're wanting to show. Even if you're doing a test case, you want to make sure that the POS is transferring to the TMS. Um, 
if you have any player servers using external storage, you want to make sure that uh, all storage devices are powered on before you power on the server and the projectors. Um, with the uh, with the projector and the IMS models, with the Dolby IMS 1000, 2000, 3000, and the GDCs, uh, 3000s, 4000s, and the SR 1000s, uh, they power on with the projector. So as soon as you turn the projector on, it goes through its process and the projector and server should automatically marry. Um, once the projector is booted up, uh, you want to make sure that the power to the players are on with the servers. So that means that um, Do Re Mi DCP 2000s, the GDC uh, SA SX 2000s, and the XX 2000 ARs, along with the Dolby DSS DSP 100s and 200s, um, are powered on right afterwards. Now, uh, pretty much everybody should know where the power switch is. The Dolby DSS DSP, uh, once you plug in a power uh, cord to the back, it automatically comes on. So you don't have really much to do with that. Um, when everything powers up, you definitely want to make sure that uh, you can log in and check for any warnings. Uh, pretty much then is when it's going to give you, you know, S and M warnings or different kind of connection warnings. Um, if that happens, uh, you know, you can go ahead and start contacting your uh, service provider, your NOC, whoever your go-to point of contact is. Um, some of the things that you want to watch for are definitely raid warnings um, and connection and transfer errors. Um, if something happens, then you can, if you feel comfortable and know how to pull logs, you can pull logs and pull them to your your service provider, your NOC. Uh, you know, you want to indicate the time, the date, what screen, and what the error was if you contact them via phone or via email. And then also, uh, you can call them and they can log in remotely. Um, I know that you know, some, some uh, companies, even down to the technician, can, can log in and make sure that they're working with you or your screens that are having issues. Um, you want to watch for SMS notifications, which could be anything from SM mismatch, missing, unable to connect, the missing certificate. Uh, with the Dolby IMS, normally it's an SM1 LED that's on the front plate that pops up. Um, it could indicate battery failures, loss of IDs. It's not connecting um, down to the media block it might need to be replaced because it might have not been powered down properly or powered back on and cycled the way it should be. Um, so you want to make sure that those things are working. Watch for raid drive warnings. Um, that's all too common, um, especially after a long boot down period. Uh, sometimes it can be worked around if you've only got one raid that is bad versus uh, one raid drive versus uh, two raid drives, you can still play a movie. You just have to unmount it, which service providers should be able to help out with that um, or Knox. And then watch for device connection areas. You want to make sure that your projector, automation, audio, and closed caption devices upon playback are all connected so that way it works seamlessly as the way it's supposed to. Um, with the screen management systems, the SMS log retrieval, uh, pretty straightforward. It's right there. Um, how to do that. You just need to log into the system and you can pull it. But nine times out of 10, most everybody's working with a service provider or a not uh, center that can go in and do that for you. If not, they're more than welcome to, uh, you know, more than happy to walk you through and how to be able to pull that, put it to a thumb drive and email it. So those are some pretty simplistic things. Um, once everything you've got powered up and it looks green, uh, you want to make sure that you start doing tests. So that means you want to send a test, uh, a test schedule to your TMS from your POS. You want to ingest some content. You can do it locally from a CRU drive, or you can do it over the network from a satellite server. And then try testing some content. Pick a couple of trailers, move them to screen number one. Pick a couple of different trailers, move them to screen number three. Um, that way, you're not moving all the same things across, and you can kind of keep track of what's transferring, what's not. Um, then you want to make sure that you got the uh, the SMN te SMS tests are going good. So that means testing your uh automation controls, make sure your lights go up and down, your sound switches, make sure you can do all of that from the Do Re Mi uh, or Dolby and your GDCs. Uh, explanations are right there. You just have to execute the micro, do it from a local level, and then you can start working with the uh, with the cues inside of the system because you want to make sure it's working at a fundamental level first. Um, and then, you know, if you don't have masking, don't have to worry about it. But uh, you want to test everything locally. And then after that, you want to do some playback tests. 
Uh, you can play, you know, test with a trailer first, just make sure it works. Um, you know, and, and, you know, you can turn everything on, open everything up, turn on your lights, play a trailer. And then if you want to, you can put some cues in it. And then underneath that, uh, test some encrypted content. If you don't have any encrypted content, uh, to the side is a place that you can go and get some, some test encrypted content, put some cues into it, make sure it functions as it's supposed to. Um, and then there also, you can test the content. If the, the test content is encrypted, um, it's all right there on where to download and how to test all of that stuff. Moving on to the next slide, uh, you know, when to call a tech. Um, obviously, there's going to be issues. Um, hopefully, there's not. And hopefully, it's limited if it is. But if it is, you want to kind of see what's going on. I would write it down, write down the screen, write down the date and time in case somebody needs to pull logs. But you want to start, you know, calling your your uh, service organi organization, whether you wait and te you test everything out and then say, OK, on screen one, this is what's having problems. Screen two, screen three, whatever. Um, you can do it at one time or you can go line item by line item. It might make it easier for your service provider if you kind of put a honey do list together and give it to them and let them work on it while you're working on getting the rest of everything up, back up and running. But content transfers, um, you want to call on KDM doesn't transfer to one or more houses. Um, your screens aren't connecting to the TMS. Once it powers up, it should automatically connect. But if it's not, you might want to call and check. Uh, your SPL is not transferring. Um, if you've got any SM related warnings, you want to call because then that way they can troubleshoot down to, is it software? Is it a player? Is it a projector? Is it hardware? you want to call and, and have them look at it because they can start facilitating if parts are needed and letting you know that uh, content storage errors, definitely call. Like I said, you can run on two, but you can't, you, know, you can't run on one. So they can unmount it. So that way things aren't skipping while stuff's getting ordered and brought in. And then obviously playback test failures, closed captioning, not working, which remember there's a lot of different parts with the closed captioning. So if you've got headsets, make sure the battery's replaced, make sure it's uh, charged. Um, missing image, missing audio, or playback skipping, drop frames, definitely call your service tech. And then on the next page, we've got uh, all the contact information for GDC and Dolby. Here list all the videos uh, that is best practices if you're going to remain closed or troubleshooting uh, tips. They have very, very good uh, content to be able to have that happen. And it works out in your favor, but you definitely want to make sure that you are calling and give yourself enough time because it's already going to be stressful enough with everything else going on. The sooner you can get in and start testing and start engaging the different companies, the better you will be in a long run because you won't feel like you're under the gun and under an extreme amount of stress. You can rely on your partners uh, in your manufacturers and your service providers to help you out the best they can. All right, Kobe. Thank you very much for all of that. That's a lot of information to digest, and uh, hopefully it, it's uh, not as complicated as it as it seems. That I think we'll uh, get a chance if you give yourself enough time to uh, get up on screen with your servers. Thanks again. Not a problem. Thank you. Okay, the uh, that's a lot of information. Thank you very much for everybody who is uh, uh, providing links in the chat for various uh, technical resources. Uh, very helpful. Once uh, again, don't forget your captioning uh, systems and your hearing impaired systems and certainly test your on-screen advertising as you go. And it's a perfect time to uh, go through and clean out a lot of old content if, uh, if uh, you've got the time to do so. So next we're going to be discussing uh, a, a quick trip through the audio system and uh, power up with uh, Barry Farrell. Hi, this is Barry Farrell, Vice President of Cinema Product Development and Strategy at QSC. And we're here today to talk about restoring your cinema audio system. Thank you for attending this ICTA webinar. I'm sure that we're all looking forward to getting our cinemas back up and running. In general, sound systems are very tolerant of shutdowns. The supply chain for audio systems is global. There are a lot of shipments from factories to warehouses to other warehouses to end users. And the audio gear is likely to have been unused in a warehouse for longer than the COVID-19 shutdown has lasted. Uh, but this shutdown does give us an opportunity to take care of some preventative maintenance and system checks that might not happen when a cinema is running 365 days a year. 
So when turning on your typical sound system, uh, you generally want to turn on all of the processors, crossovers, and booth monitors first before turning on the power amplifiers. That prevents any pops and noises uh, that come from the electronics and line level equipment from being amplified and sent to the loudspeakers, potentially damaging them. Now this is a good practice. Uh, all the time. You should uh, always do this uh, when starting the theater up in the morning. And uh, for the reverse, uh, when you shut the system down, turning the amplifiers off first will uh, prevent anything from being amplified uh, that might come from the line level gear when you shut it off in the evening. So uh, let's move on to the uh, loudspeakers. Uh, there's quite a few things that we can check on the loudspeaker front. Uh, it's especially a great time right now uh, before we get the theaters open again to check for non-functional loudspeakers. This is especially an issue with surrounds and subwoofers. Uh, screen channel issues are more often noticed by the cinema staff and patrons, uh, but a failed surround speaker, it might be one out of only six on a channel, and it would be very easy to have one fail and have it not be noticed. So go into the auditorium, play pink noise into each channel in turn, and listen in front of each surround speaker to make sure that all of them are working. Uh, one of the things that you want to do when you're listening is to pay attention to sound differences between each channel. You shouldn't have a big variation as you move between the loudspeakers in the surround array or between channels of the screen channels. Uh, you know, if a frequency band is missing on the screen channels, take some time to find out why. If there's no high frequencies, maybe it's a compression driver that's out or an amp channel is not working. And as you switch uh, from left to center to right, there shouldn't be a huge change in the quality of sound from the speakers. Uh, check the subwoofers too. Uh, subwoofers are very prone to physical damage because they're generally placed on the floor and accidents can happen during cleaning. Stuff gets thrown underneath the screen and it can damage the speakers and we've also found that subwoofers have been stolen. So this is a good time to check to make sure that the subwoofers are okay and uh, also to see that they haven't moved due to their vibrations. Uh, if they're on a smooth floor that might have a little bit of tilt, they can uh, vibrate and move during normal operation. Uh, using some rubber mats under the subs is a good way to solve that. Uh, take a look at your subwoofer placement too. It's, it's really best to cluster the subwoofers together and place them up against the wall. If you've got subwoofers that are spread apart or are placed well out from the wall, you're not getting the maximum efficiency from the system. And you could get coverage in the auditorium that's not as uniform as having them all grouped together. And uh, as far as the screen channels, uh, it's really a good time to uh, check the aiming of the screen channels. If you have the access and can get behind the screen and get up to the uh, left, center, and right speakers, uh, check to see that the horns are still properly aimed. Uh, on some products, it's possible for the adjustment to get loose and then the uh, tilt of the horn can change. And usually it winds up with the horn pointed up at the ceiling. And, uh, you know, get up there, make sure it's aimed correctly, make sure everything's tightened down. Uh, while you're at it, check the wiring and, and any switches that uh, need to be set on the screen channels as well. Make sure the wires are tight and connected. And, uh, you know, some screen channels have an option for two-way or three-way operation. Or, uh, you know, you have to make sure that switch is set if you're bi-amplified or tri-amplified. Uh, so check that uh, wire up there as well. Uh, let's move on to amplifiers. Uh, the uh, biggest issue that we see with amplifiers is that uh, they get filled with dust and dirt. You know, amplifiers are fan cooled, and uh, but to reduce uh, the dust buildup, we use variable speed fans. They run at low speed most of the time to move less air and dirt through the amplifier. But given that uh, you know we see our amplifiers in use for 10, 15, or 20 years, it does give them an opportunity to fill up with dust and dirt. In an ideal situation, if you have the time and you're confident in your ability to do it without damaging anything, you know, taking the amps out of the rack and taking the tops off and blowing out or vacuuming out the worst of the dirt and dust and grime uh, is a good idea. If you don't have the time and are concerned about uh, your ability to accomplish without damage uh, to the uh, amplifier, uh, you can just use a shop back on the front and rear grills to remove the worst of the dust and dirt accumulation. Uh, this is also a good time to check things like uh, gain settings and uh, security covers. Uh, some of our most popular cinema amplifiers uh, are typically used with the data port processors and that requires that the gain control be set for full up uh, for proper operation. That's all the way clockwise. 
and we supply security covers with those amplifiers uh, to make sure that, that it's not tampered with. So uh, sometimes during the uh, you know, checkups and things like that, these security covers could get, get removed. And it's a good idea to check to see if they've just been tossed in the bottom of the rack. And if so, uh, make sure the gain controls are set properly and reinstall those uh, uh, security covers to prevent any uh, future tampering. Uh, another thing that we run into on amplifiers is sometimes uh, they're not set correctly. Uh, there are uh, dip switches on a QSC amplifier and other types of switches on other brands uh, that set things like the operating mode. Uh, amplifiers can be run uh, in a stereo mode, uh, you know, a, a two-channel amp would be operated with two channels or in bridge mode where the two channels are connected together into a single channel. And uh, you need to make sure that uh, the amp is uh, correctly configured. Uh, sometimes, uh, if you're not sure about that, you can check to see if there's an identical system in another auditorium and see what the settings are on those. Uh, but in any case, uh, it's really a good idea to make sure that all of the configuration switches are properly set. Uh, with the QSC system, if you're using our data port processors, you also have to make sure that you turn off the high pass filter on the amplifier uh, because it is uh, uh, taken uh, into account in the DSP of the, of the processor. So you don't want to have two high pass filters in operation and uh, especially on subwoofers because it'll remove the extreme low base. Uh, moving on to uh, things like processors and crossovers. We find that the most common errors uh, really is, is uh, the incorrect level setting. It's pretty easy to check the levels uh, of the main channels, uh, left, center, right, uh, left and right surround. Uh, when you're setting those channels, you can use a sound pressure level meter. Uh, it should be calibrated and it should have C weighting and slow response. And uh, if you're doing the screen channels, go two thirds of the way back in the auditorium and adjust for 85 dBC. Uh, surrounds are normally set at 82. Uh, and make sure that the fader on the processor is set at zero dB or seven, depending upon the processor model, uh, before setting those uh, channel levels. Uh, problems most often occur with the subwoofer setting. You cannot set the subwoofer level using an SPL meter. You have to do it with a RTA, a real-time analyzer. Once the center channel has been EQ'd and adjusted for level, then you use the RTA frequency bands to adjust the subwoofer level to be 10 dB higher than the center channel. It's the only correct way to set the sub level. If you have the sub set too high, uh, which happens if you try to set it with an SPL meter, you'll end up uh, overpowering and potentially damaging the subwoofers. Uh, you can see more details on subwoofers uh, with our blog post on nine reasons your sub uh, subs may be failing at the QSC website. Uh, make sure your presets are working correctly as well. Uh, you know, the cinema processors have the ability to have different levels uh, for things like trailers and features, and the, then you have 5.1 and 7.1 content uh, that you should be selecting for. So make sure that uh, whether that comes from your server over the network or comes from an automation through uh, GPIO pins, uh, make sure that uh, that is working correctly. That's one of the big uh, causes of complaints from customers due to volume. Uh, if you have this uh, capability and you set it up correctly, uh, you can set volume levels differently for trailers and for features and uh, keep all of your customers happy. So uh, that's really uh, the most important things to be checking when you uh, bring the sound system back online. Uh, there are some helpful uh, links that you can follow. Uh, QSC.com, I already mentioned that we have a number of blog posts uh, about cinema sound systems. And Dolby also has uh, information for starting your systems back up. Uh, we're really happy to uh, help you. If you have specific questions, please uh, give us a call, send us an email. Uh, but uh, we're very happy to uh, help you get theaters back up and running again. We're looking very forward to having our customers uh, back into your seats. and. Uh, uh, Thanks a lot for attending this ICTA seminar. All right, good information from uh, QSC and uh, about all sound systems, really the uh, the need to get in there and, and, and check things out, check aiming, check uh, levels. It's a good time to do it. Uh, we will now be looking at our screens and it's a, it's a great time to go in and check on your screens, uh, make sure that we have the best image quality.
Hello, everyone. In this section of the uh, Technology Reboot Camp, we're going to be talking with Matt Jahans from Harkness Screens on the considerations when reopening as it uh, pertains to screens. Matt, thanks for joining us. Hey, Frank. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it'd be nice to talk today about some of the screen considerations when reopening auditoriums after COVID-19. And I think a lot of people will know this is a, a new phenomenon for everybody, and there's going to be quite a lot of questions. So I'll just mute my video and we'll proceed with the presentation. So to get going, I'm going to sort of talk about different areas. So first of all, an introduction to the COVID-19 situation, and that's from a potential screen perspective. I'm going to go through what to check for. I'm going to go through corrective measures. So what can we do about some of the things we identify? Talk a little about deep cleaning, which is quite an interesting subject, which involves a whole auditorium, including the screen. We'll go through that. And finally, an excerpt from our Heartlitz video. And it's the excerpt talking about cleaning a screen and dusting a screen, which, again, may be useful in this situation. So the COVID-19 situation, what do I mean by this with regard to screens? So the key thing here from a Hartness perspective is auditoriums have been closed. And the issue here is HVAC has likely been switched off. Now, that's something we don't recommend. Ideally, we say to customers who ask, please leave the HVAC on. But often it's going to be off. We accept that. So what does it actually mean? So potential dust can be attracted to the screen. And this can cause static effects, well, caused by static effects, attracting the dust to the screen. So this is something we have to be aware of. We'll talk about a high heat and humidity environments, and that's that's key. You can find that in certain countries, certain parts of the world where that can cause an issue with no HVAC. That can lead to uh, screens can be sagging occasionally, you know, if the plastic relaxes. We do hear stories sometimes of moisture, and in exceptional conditions, you can sometimes get mold growth on the screen, which can be an issue. And finally, we talk about uninstalled screens waiting in tubes. And what I mean by that is you may have an exhibitor who's perhaps maybe uh, bought a screen ready to install to do an upgrade, something like that. COVID-19 struck and that tube's been sitting there for some period of time. So what to check for? How are we going to look at these types of things? So for me, the most important thing to start with is a visual inspection of the screen surface. What is it actually looking like? So that's pretty obvious. We go into an auditorium, get into the seating area, move at different distances, up, down, left and right, looking at the screen from different angles. What can you see? Is there anything? So is there any obvious moisture or mold on the screen? This is quite important to check. Usually, if there's been moisture on the screen, it's to do with, as I mentioned, HVAC being switched off, but typically only for short periods of time. Say the HVAC was turned off overnight in a very warm temperature. The difference in temperature can cause issues. But if the HVAC has been off for a longer period of time, one would imagine that the ambient temperature would normalise over that period. And therefore, it's not a problem, but something to look out for. So is there an obvious dust build up? One might imagine if an auditorium has been left alone, the dust has settled from everywhere. You know, a static screen can draw that into the screen itself. There could be a, a big dust buildup that's you know, visible on the screen. And finally, though, I would say look at the screen surface itself. You know, is there any actual distortion? Has something changed? You know, I mentioned about sometimes PVC can relax with temperature changes. You know, is there something obvious we can see? And finally, is there any other damage? Now, the last point is not related to COVID-19 as such or any of the effects of that. However, if an auditorium has been down, you know, has there been any maintenance staff working in isolation that have gone in using the downtime? You know, has something been knocked? Is there something you're unaware of? Again, straightforward to look at. Now, corrective measures of all this. So what do we do? We've done the inspection. We've seen certain things. How are we going to address this? So if there is any moisture on the screen, the key thing is to let it dry. And to me, the best way to do that is by gradual HVAC introduction. So turn it on, slowly increasing it to the temperature and humidity it needs to be. The key thing here is the, the bullet point says is avoid manually trying to do that. If you have any patches of moisture on the screen, if you put a cloth on it and immediately start to rub the screen and dry it, any dust that is on the screen will be essentially embedded in, smeared, and will cause dirty streaks. And the downside of that, of course, is we're playing movie content. We don't want dirty, you know, dirty streaks showing up during light scenes of movie content. Now, mold I mentioned earlier, 
mould. It's not common. It is unlikely. However, it is possible, again, particularly in very high humidity environments without any HVAC. Now, the problem you get there, if there is mould growth and it's allowed to grow into the screen, particularly a coated screen surface, there's often not a lot you can do about that. It's actually grown into the coating itself. No amount of cleaning, even if you can do it gently, is, is not going to solve that problem. Unfortunately, that's probably a screen replacement. So it's something we don't want. Now, if there's any small marks on the screen, you know, these can potentially be spot cleaned using the Hartness method I'll go through. And what I mean by spot cleaning on marks, something like if there is maybe ketchup or a small patch of cola on the screen. I'm not talking the entire screen, but little areas where they might want to be addressed. Now, if there are any signs of sagging, sometimes you can try, depending on the type of screen installation frame, perhaps a retention, if that's possible, can, that, can address that. But, you know, exercise caution with curve frames, of course, if you put too much horizontal tension, you can put a belly in. But of course, when you're looking at this, wait till the HVAC is back on. You know, if there's something very, very minor due to the change in heat over time, bringing it back up to temperature can come, you know, cause things to go back to as they need to be. But do look out for that. It's something worth checking. And with regard to screens in tubes, Hartness will recommend that screens are installed after 12 weeks. Of course, if something's got stuck in a sort of COVID-19 situation, you may, of course, have screens you know, being in tubes for a lot longer than that. Now, although we advise 12 weeks and that's, you know, that is what we do stipulate, it may well be if it's been longer than that. Chances are it can be fine if the ambient temperatures haven't been too harsh or it's left out in direct sunlight or very dusty conditions, something like this. But to me, the key thing, again, is installation. Try the screen. Don't think it's suddenly dead just because it's been a bit longer than that. Install it, visually inspect it. The chances are it's going to be OK. You know, it's not been that long necessarily, but, you know, just do give it that inspection. Now, deep cleaning is an interesting one. I do get a lot of people asking about it. And to me, there's three primary methods of deep cleaning. So the first one I always hear about is UV. Now, Hartness don't say do deep cleaning or don't do deep cleaning, but we would give advice of what potentially can happen. So when we talk about UV, the key thing here is it can age plastics prematurely. So be that PVC of a screen, be that seats in the auditorium, anything. We're all aware of that. However, UV, particularly UVC, we hear about being used as very effective for viruses. Potentially, if there's a sensible delivery method, it's good for the audience, meaning they're not present. UV, of course, would be dangerous if it was being deployed while the audience were there. So obviously, caution for the operator using the equipment, but one would imagine those sorts of users would be very familiar with it. So that's something that is a consideration. Ozone we hear about, people are asking, can I use ozone, you know, and have that going around the whole auditorium? For us, that's a big no-no. We, we would really not recommend ozone. It's extremely harmful. And the key thing, it's harmful in very low concentrations. And one of the major problems with this is to do with lung inhalation. Um, you know, anyone with any respiratory problems, this can cause an issue. And of course, COVID-19 is exactly that. So we would absolutely say stay away from ozone. Another one I hear about is chemical fogging or fumigation. Now, the thing here with chemical fogging or fumigation is which chemicals are we using? So you may have a, a certain mix of chemical, which works fine. You know, for example, I hear with fogging, things like hydrogen peroxide, we hear this could potentially be okay. It may be good, but, a, but the key thing is to, to do some testing on this. It may work in one situation, it may, on in, it may not in another. A certain concentration could be very harmful, it may not be. I think the, the main thing really is, and I put a final point here, is I'd say contact Hartness for a case-by-case -case advice on this. So obvious advice might be if there's time to do this, and I would urge people if they're considering, don't just suddenly choose one method and you know adhere this to your whole estate. You know, try one auditorium, try one multiplex. Does this work? Are there any issues? And the other thing is obviously the the, the repetitive of uses. It may well be you do one UV treatment, one chemical fogging, the screen comes out, you know, comes out perfectly fine. Of course, if you're doing it repeatedly, decide to do this every day or after showing, you know, considerable um sorry uh, repeatable treatments of this could cause more problems just because you're doing it time after time so it's important to understand that so 
Moving on to the video I talked about, I think if we go back to things like dusting, we come back to spot cleaning. If there are small things affecting the screen, you know, not too serious, there are, there are things you can do. Ideally, I tell customers if there's not a real problem, forgetting COVID-19 now, just talking generally, do I need to clean my screen? Well, no. If an auditorium's kept in good clean condition, perhaps your, you know, your cinema's not by a big dirty factory or a huge motorway or something like that it should be fine but again if there is a dust buildup, you might want to address that if there are spot marks of you know ketchup cola whatever it might be something you want to address and the key thing with any of this is screens are fragile Hartness screen services are very good technical services you know surfaces sorry they're very robust however they're still scientific paint coated surfaces so you've got to treat them with the due respect so the video i'm going to go through next will show a very simple way of doing this where you can treat it very kindly <coughs> excuse me so here's the two the two staff members here and there's a screen which looks very very dusty with some spot marks now how we would advise customers to clean this is use a long extendable pole and we can advise people on this and the important thing is with a very soft microfiber cloth on the head. So this in theory shouldn't damage the screen. Now you'll see the first user very gently putting it to the top of the screen, then start to walk backwards. They're applying no pressure. As the, as the pole gets lower, there's of course more pressure. So a second teammate takes the weight and lowers it with them to the bottom of the screen. <clears throat> now, once you get to the bottom of that screen, you've got dust on there. So shake out any dust. Hopefully it won't be as bad as this, this big dust cloud here, but whatever's on there, shake it off so it's not on there. Then working out from the middle, carrying on, go out to one side all the way to the bottom, shaking it off each time, two-man team, then back to the middle and moving out to the other side. And this will take out any, you know, take off any surface dust and you know get it off the screen you need. But of course, as you can see in the cartoon here, you can still have spot marks or cola, mustard, whatever it may be. So to clean these, you used to carefully use this with, you know, I would say a very, um, a bucket of water here, a very, very mild surfactant, something like a, a very mild liquid soap used to wash dishes, just one or two drops. And the, the important thing here is do not rub the screen. So you can see here, we're dabbing the screen very gently, not rubbing up and down or left or right. That could damage the screen surface. <clears throat> and the important thing here is to take your time. This could take 15 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes just gently going dab 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 and over time you'll get off as much as possible now if it's a very greasy coating so if it was something that had you know oil based if that's been on there for a long time you may never get it off but you can make a considerable improvement and i think the key to getting these sort of spot marks off is to get there quickly but the point here we're talking covid19 it's less likely to be spot marks it's more likely to be a dust build up but the video here just shows that there are ways you can do it so i think frank frank perhaps passing back to you now i think i've come to the end of my slides now but i think hopefully this has been useful for some of the users and it is a unusual subject i would say so it's great to have been asked along to present yeah thank you very much for that matt uh looks like uh what key takeaway here is uh you know it's a perfect time to go through and, and evaluate your screens and uh ensure that they're in good condition and these are uh, these are good uh notes and points to be made for all screens out there so uh thank you very much for your information and thanks for participating in the reboot camp matt absolutely welcome frank thank you very much all right we uh, addressed our screens there and uh good to note about the different cleaning methods that are being proposed uh, potentially in some of these uh, auditoriums as we proceed with uh, the sanitizing rooms so uh, uh, keep note of that and with next we'll be talking with Alan Rowe and discussing point of sale hello everyone this is the uh, rebooting the point of sale uh, reopening sales channels and reducing human contact I'm here with Alan Rowe CEO of Jack Rowe and president of ICTA who's going to be going through these topics with you Hello, Alan. Hi, Frank. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, we've uh, already been through some introductions and so on. We've uh, not got a lot of time and quite a lot to cover. So 
Uh, I'm just going to uh, turn off my, my webcam and get uh, get straight into it. So um, the POS, uh, the first stage is going to be just trying to get back on your feet. Your cinema has been closed for um, anywhere between five, six to 10, 15 weeks by the time you reopen um, and stuff can happen. So the most important thing being to just get back on your feet. Um, you can have any day of the year, you can be unlucky. You can have a hardware failure on the POS, on a cash draw, on a printer, on a power strip, on anything. Every day, it's a very small risk. But when you've got that many weeks, obviously, it, it all adds up. Um, so it could be potential hardware failures, network problems, ISP changes. It could just be that there's a 90 minute Windows update waiting to happen on all your pulse stations. Um, so just try to go in early, get that pulse station up and running, you know, days ahead, maybe a week ahead of when you're going to start selling tickets and just make sure everything works because you've got plenty of time to deal with it at that stage. But if you get to the day before when you and lots of other theaters open your doors, then of course you're going to be running out of time, whether that's from your pulse company and from your network company, from colleagues. So just test out what was working before to make sure you're back at that baseline. Um, on top of that, you may well have powered down a lot of stuff which uh, you wouldn't normally power down, whether that's digital signage or pulse stations and so on. Um, so that might be more likely to have triggered an issue. Um, you potentially had less or no heating in the building. Um, and then, of course, almost all the pulse stations will have been updated with new programs because of, of the changes relating um, to COVID. So just go in early, just check that baseline. Please don't leave it to the last minute to make sure that um, you're there when, uh, when you're ready to sell tickets. Um, from that, we then got on to implementing new and existing features. And um, I say new and existing because in some cases it's it's new things that relate specifically to COVID. In other cases, it might be um, existing features that are now required that, that that you perhaps haven't implemented before. Now, the big uh, the biggest item that that most of us have been talking about with and most of us the, the, and the other POS companies and the cinemas have been been talking about uh, has been social distancing within the auditorium. So I'm going to spend uh, spend longest uh, on that one. Um, it, it varies. Some uh, some countries and some states are saying, uh, you know, that there is perhaps a an auditorium capacity um, limit. Um, others are saying that that you need a, a set distance, uh, say a meter from seat to seat um, uh, when people are sat down. Um, so it's changing all the time. Those capacities are going to change as well. It could vary by auditorium based on the size of the seat. So you're going to have from your POS provider. Um, controls around uh, the number of seats that will be automatically put between people and um, that will apply on the same row and it may well apply also um, in the the seats in front of and behind people as you can see uh, in this uh, this picture here now there's kind of two sides to this the first one is the legal requirement in terms of maintaining that legal distance and then the second one is what this does to seating capacities which is unfortunately quite disastrous um, so it, it, the, the way that people sit in the auditorium will hugely impact uh, the occupancy that you the capacity you can get in there. Um, this is similar to uh, requirements that, again, all the pause companies have had to implement in the past to do with trying to prevent people from having a single seat between one another. People sit where they want to sit uh, unless you restrict them. Now, um, as an example, if you have, say, a row of 12 seats by themselves um, and you have uh, six people and they sit two on the far left and then a gap of two, another two and two. Then you've got two seats between them. So if that's your requirement, you've met that and you've got six people in six people in that row of 12 seats. But in another situation, you could have four tickets being bought and you have a gap of two seats. They sit in the next two, another gap. That's your first six seats. And then you have the same thing over on the right. Just happens to be where people sit. Now, of course, um, the one relative to the other, you've got a 50% increase in terms of the number of people sat in that row. Um, so you start to wander into this territory of actually needing to restrict or, or, or potentially wanting to restrict where people sit within the auditorium, uh, which could have some, uh, some, some customer service obviously impact. Um, but if the alternative is that you can't reach those seating capacities that you need to in order to make it viable and that your cinema therefore stays closed a little longer, then I would, I would hope that presented carefully to the customers that they will be, be understanding. Um, 
Uh, so occupancy becomes uh, becomes a key factor. Um, a lot of cinemas are doing things at the moment to do with having, say, an empty row uh, between uh, between rows. Um, but occupancy, people are often talking about, say, 25 percent or they're saying, oh, if we can get up to things like 40. But it, it can impact a lot worse than that. If you have 100 percent of the seats to start off with and you take out every other row, then by definition, you're at 50 percent. If people then sit in the perfect positions and if you have two people in each group, um, just to, to simplify things, um, then at that point, you're right around 25 percent. Now, if you have to take off um, a, a seat on the aisle, that could change things if you have to have a, a, a row of or, or sort of a column of seats that are empty there. Um, but then if people sit in the wrong spaces, you're now getting well below 25 percent seating capacity. You could be getting down as low as sort of 15 percent seating capacity. So um, this is this is definitely something that needs to be considered. Now, so far, I've talked really just about um, reserved seating. Unreserved, unfortunately, at first sight would seem simple, but but has its own problems. So it's all well and good saying, right, we're going to allow 25 percent occupancy into this auditorium and it's going to be unreserved. Well, we've just said that the occupancy of the room depends on where people sit. So you don't any longer have a hard limit on how many seats you have in the auditorium, because where people sit will determine how many people you can get in there. Um, one example of this, if you have one person and um, the minimum that they can occupy, if you're allowing two seats between people, is uh, two seats. That's their own seat. And the one seat next to them, if you then allow that the one seat next to that belongs to the next person. And that's part of a, a two seat gap between them. They have half each. So minimum two, uh, but then up to five people, if they five seats, if they sit in the middle of nowhere. So you've got this, this huge variation uh, based on where they sit, but also huge variation in terms of the size of the groups. If you have a large group, then um, they're each individually taking up fewer seats after you allow for those spaces. So the capacity of the auditorium is determined both by where people sit and also in the size of the groups that arrive at the cinema. So you, you've got some complexities around that uh, to consider as well. Um, these are all things which, as I say, the software companies have been, been factoring in. So, you know, it's really important that you stay in contact with your POS provider to find out what's in there, find out about it ahead of time. Um, you can put information out to your customer base to assure them what you're doing and what they can expect when they get there. Um, obviously, monitoring it to try and make sure people are in the right seats. Um, Outside of that, there's there's all kinds of, of, of other considerations as well. Refills might no longer be possible. So you might want to consider alternative um, drinks deals for customers um, because you, you probably aren't allowed to take um, the risk of, of, of having something from the customer back behind the concession stand. Um, you've got potential payment changes and there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, the All the POS companies and all the cinemas were all trying to figure this out in terms of interpreting um, the legislation and the politicians are obviously doing the best they can with the time available to them and the knowledge available to them, but it will continue to evolve. We've had, you know, some, uh, you know, one governor saying um, no pin pads. And then we've had, um, you know, other cinemas who are saying, well, they don't want to give cash back to the customers. Um, so it really does vary. Some are saying use the pin pads. Some are saying don't use the pin pads. Um, contactless is great. I think MasterCard have said that they've seen a 40% increase worldwide um, on contactless in the first quarter of 2020. Um, so for cinemas who currently are not using pen pads, it's, it might be time to really seriously consider that because your customers might be demanding it. Um, you, you, you could lose customers if you don't have them. So it's, it's worth considering if you haven't yet implemented the pin pad technologies um, to, to put that in. Um, you then got the question around self-service um, kiosks. Um, again, split opinion. Some people say that there are, you know, potentially going to harbor germs. Um, others say, well, it's a good way to keep people away from the employees, which obviously is, is critical. Um, so it's important to, to, to keep an eye on what the, the specific laws and so on are in your area, in your country, because it, it is varying and it is evolving rapidly. Um, there's also concerns and considerations around paperless ticketing. Again, going into you know existing functionality that a lot of the uh, POS systems have. Uh, this might be something that you haven't needed to deploy before, but now you want to consider um, because then you can have uh, have no contact at the point at the end of the hallway. There's also even within paperless uh, ticketing and so on, there are variations around people doing sort of self check-in and things like that. So again, make sure you're in contact with your POS provider. If you're not getting communications, make sure that you're on their newsletter list and that you're getting that information um, uh, as, it, uh, as it comes ready. Um, 
those are some of the some of the key areas. There's other cinemas doing things like um, uh, curbside uh, delivery. So that gives you an opportunity to get some funds in before your cinema opens or, or, or in fact, even even while it is for for for, for many. Um, then you've got other considerations like people using time clock. Uh, you could have questions and so on around it uh, to make sure that people don't have a temperature, that they haven't been around people who might be, that they haven't been in public areas. So you can get them all to fulfill perhaps that kind of thing first. Um, be aware of the unintended consequences. Um, scheduling, if you've got much lower capacities, then you might want to schedule films, the same film into multiple auditoriums, particularly when content is thin at the, at the front end of this. Um, you need to allow perhaps longer for cleaning. Um, with scheduling, if an employee didn't turn up before, it was annoying to have the popcorn on the floor, but now it could be, you know, you could be endangering, uh, it could be, um, you need to make sure obviously that they're there for the for the cleaning between auditoriums, so that becomes consideration. Extending expiration dates, that applies both to behind the concession stand on food, if there's anything there, um, but also memberships, gift cards, loyalty cards, is there anything that needs to be extended? Otherwise, um, obviously you're gonna have customer service issues when people do arrive at the cinema. Um, you know, there is a sort of a bright side to this as well, though, in terms of, um, you know, there might be um, space for new alternative content. So um, that's something to consider. A lot of venues obviously have been closed and there's a lot of things that need to happen and not enough spaces for them to happen. So so there might be more opportunity to get um, sort of party rentals and so on going uh, once the cinemas start to get open. Um, and then a key thing is just communications, communications internally. Make sure that, you know, your, that your employees understand what is expected of them, what is absolutely required of them and, and how to stay safe as well. It's not just about keeping the employee, the, the customer safe, but keeping colleagues um, safe as well, of course. Uh, equally, communicating with customers. They want to be reassured. Um, so give them that reassurance, let them know what you're doing, let them know when you're opening, what to expect um, so that they don't have um, surprise when they get to, to the cinema. Um, but yeah, lots of different things going on in the POS, um, changing constantly. And like all features that go into POS, they will change once they get in the field as well as, as we and other POS companies get feedback um, directly from cinemas and things continue to change. So that's a sort of whistle stop tour of what's, uh, what's going on for, for within POS for uh, for opening the uh, the theaters back up i'll hand back uh, back over to frank all right thank you very much alan that's uh alan rowe uh ceo of jack rowe and president of the icta with rebooting the point of sale that was a fantastic session uh so far that we've had uh thanks again to all the uh, presenters that have joined us uh so far today uh, if you give us a little bit of time, we will open the floor up to questions and start bringing some of our presenters up on stage uh, to join Frank. And uh, my colleague, Rebecca Polly will be uh, assisting us in moderating some of this uh, special Q&A session. All right. Uh, so while we get people back on stage here, I know, Frank, a question that came up in, in the question section, something that uh, you said you touch on is uh, John from Screen Vision asked about on-screen advertising systems, uh, bringing those back up. Uh, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, those are, those are certainly a critical part of your systems out there. And when you are, uh, when you get your test content, you'll need to go in there, create a show as you normally would. Uh, even preferably through your TMS and pass it on to your system so that you can check the entire chain of, of content you know, within the building and uh, ensure that all your automation works, your lights are going up your, uh, or, or down, and uh, ensure that your pre-show starts and stops uh, as it is automated to do so. Oh. There we oh my goodness so right. I was gonna I was gonna screw something up somehow uh, welcome back everyone thanks so much uh, for the information you provided I'm very pleased that the complete director's cut version of the Harklets video has been shared in the, <laughs> in the chat everyone needs their Harklets uh, sort of a, a general question that, that uh, came up throughout throughout this seminar is um, just kind of across the board in terms of checking calibration, in terms of audio systems. What can people be doing now once, I mean, things are things are shut off, it's just kind of maintenance things that they maybe should take advantage of this time to do it that they couldn't do before when a theater was uh, in normal operations? 
All right. Uh, Kobe, do you want to address some of those? Uh, or uh, or uh, let's see. Can I unmute you? There you go. Or Dan? I'll, I'll let Dan start off. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think right now, ideally, there's a lot of time uh, to get a lot of maintenance stuff done. Uh, it's, it's ideal because we're not affecting shows. Um, so as as we start to bring things back on, obviously, we're going to want to do as much preventative maintenance as possible. Um, as previously discussed in our slides, both mine and Kobe's, uh, you know, upgrades to the equipment, get with your manufacturer, get with your service provider. Um, upgrade equipment to the latest software and firmware revisions, um, clean the systems, uh, make sure your presentation is up to par. I mean, we're going to be in a very interesting uh, situation where we're trying to coax our audiences back into the theaters. So the best way for us to uh, to lead uh, is to make sure our presentation is top notch. So looking at those aspects, uh, I think moving forward is, is going to be a huge step in the right direction. And, and as much work as we can get done ahead of time is, is going to be ideal. I agree. This is a good time to, to get in there and, uh, and do a lot of those things. What Did you have something to add, Toby? Oh, no. I mean, I'd right on with Dan. I mean, right now when the theaters are empty is the time to be able to get in, identify you know, make that list together, you know, budget it against whatever the, you know, needs to be done to get on screen. But, uh, you know, the more time you have, the more time you have for success, chance favors the prepared mind. Definitely. Uh, and, and the service itself is is a long lead item. Parts replacement is a long, potentially long lead item as those, you know, mechanisms start to uh, start functioning again. Uh, I certainly suggest uh, there's a there's a lot of different uh, resources for testing encrypted content. Dolby, uh, uh, the sponsor of the webinar, is uh, also uh, provided a, a link for their decked content, which is encrypted content. You want to make sure you're testing encrypted content. ISDCF has uh, a link on their website to encrypted content, and Deluxe is managing the keys for that. Uh, I think uh, Cinema Next had mentioned in the uh, chat room that they have uh, some encrypted and unencrypted content. Uh, the CST uh, FNCF in France has also uh, test content for uh, for checking systems. So uh, thank you to everybody who is uh, providing that so we can uh, check the full uh, uh, the full circuit of the system. So. Uh and Matt, uh, there was some some chatter during the Harkness presentation about the question of, you know, whether the virus can stay on screens, how long it can stay on screens, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You're not a virologist, but uh, are you are you I'm hearing? Lucky. Yeah, I don't know. You maybe you are. I hit the microphone. <laughs> uh, are you finding from exhibitor partners? I mean, I would assume when you're cleaning the screen, wear masks, wear gloves. Presumably. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it is going to be depend what you're trying to clean the screen with. So, as I said in the video, the actual screen surface itself, if you had to do what I call spot cleaning, now that's not COVID-19 related as such, but mm -hmm. that there you're using a very, very mild product, so that's not an issue. I think the issue when you're talking mask and gloves and things, we're talking if you start to use some sort of chemical process. Mm -hmm. And with regard to the virus itself, as you say, whilst I'm not a virologist, when you hear about different things about viruses lasting on surfaces, we hear things lasting several hours or maybe a couple of days. In my opinion, the reality is a cinema has been shut for weeks. It might have been shut for a month or two months or whatever. In reality, there's not likely to be a virus on the surface. That said, mm -hmm. people are doing disinfecting sanitation of the auditorium as a whole. And of course, as that, the screen becomes part of it. So I think as to equipment cleaning the screen, yes, of course, it's just good practice to wear something. But I personally think the virus itself wouldn't be on the screen surface. You know, if someone mm -hmm. say coughed on it, having not been in the cinema for weeks would be my personal take. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even if someone's in the front row, I don't I don't think a sneeze can reach the screen <laughs> unless someone is seriously powerful uh, <laughs> uh, we have a comment uh, we have a comment uh from mark louis here in, in the in the question uh section uh from alamo draft house uh about stressing the importance for exhibitors of having someone designated to uh monitor the presentations monitor the equipment uh what's what's your thoughts on that just operationally Definitely. Uh, if 
if you can get somebody in there to have eyes on entire presentations and ensuring that uh, both you look good and the, the content looks good, that would that's an excellent idea, an excellent opportunity, and to ensure that the systems that have been dormant uh, continue to function automatically through, throughout the course of this uh, reboot. Mm -hmm. Would you want to add something there, uh, Alan? You're, you're on mute. So yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, um, absolutely from a technological standpoint and then also from a, from a legal standpoint, of course, all the POS companies have put this software to try and say where people should be sat, sat for that cinema to stay legal. But all you need is for some people not to pay attention to that, sit where they like. And A, it could be dangerous. B, you could get inspected. So absolutely, I think um, enforcement checking and so on is key. Uh, whereas before, obviously, you're relying on someone to say that perhaps someone's talking in the auditorium, doing something they shouldn't be doing, and they may or may not report that at this stage. You can't just rely on customers to come out and tell you that someone's sat in the wrong place. So definitely keep an eye on that. It's, it's critical to remaining open. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark, for raising it. Yep. Did it again. There are some additional questions. Uh, and unfortunately, we are, we are running low on time. And uh, I don't want to stretch this out too much longer everyone's everyone's come on stage here and and, and lent their time to this so um there's been questions about the availability of this session uh, it will be provided by the icta a recording um as to the, the the slides themselves like the pdf presentations uh, i believe the answer to that is we're working on it yep so, okay that's the answer that's the answer so um, uh, we'll, we'll work on getting all this uh, uh information available to everybody and uh please feel free to contact your servicer and and your manufacturers uh to you know fill in any of the missing information uh that we haven't touched on um and as far as the rest of this everybody that is attends will also be receiving a document with the links uh that we provided in the presentations so you have something to, to take away uh, with you. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, to Frank and to all the panelists here. Uh, thank you so much to everyone uh, who has attended this panel today. Uh, of course, thank you. Thank you to Dolby. Thank you to everyone. We appreciate everyone, and it's uh, it's very important for the community to come together right now. Yeah, so. for sure. And uh, all this will be available on the uh, International Cinema Technology uh, Association webpage or uh, our Facebook page. So uh, when you get a chance, you can go see that. And thanks for uh, to Box Office Pro for hosting this. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. All right. Thank you. I actually don't know how that. <laughs> Not quite sure. Turn this yeah, off. There, you go. there we go.